Hi there, folks. This is a, I guess, a slight uh, commentary video on the uh, home dev stream that they put out uh, on Twitch yesterday. You know, the the Warframe devs and and uh, Reb and talking about some of the stuff going on right now with the game, with uh, upcoming, uh, you know, new content, and with the helmet system. I'm gonna focus mostly on the helmet system. Uh, they talked about some other stuff that's gonna come uh, with, you know, updates to Heart of Dimos. They showed off a new uh, Necromech, a second Necromech that you can get. And uh, talked about infested kit guns coming, which is something we knew before as well. Uh, but I'm mostly interested in the stuff they were talking about regarding the helmet system. And, uh, you know, they, they touched on the, the sort of marked for death uh, nerf, if you want to call it that as well. So let's let's go over that. Uh, first up, obviously, is they... Um, I'm not even sure I'm going to use the word nerf, because that's really not exactly what happened. Um, as most people know, it was recently discovered that uh, one of the uh, innate helmet abilities, that it's not one that you subsume from another Warframe, but it's just one that you get from the helmet itself, um, called Marked for Death. Here, this one. Um, it, people have started figuring out that you could do some pretty degenerate things with uh, this ability. So what it does is you, you target an enemy with it, and when you kill the enemy, uh, like, the, the damage you deal to it will be dealt to enemies around it as well. Uh, naturally, people, and, and I thought about this as well, because it's, it's the obvious one, people gravitated toward uh, Ash with this. Because you can do, you can, you can teleport in and do finishers with, like, massive damage. So the idea was, you mark for death an enemy, then you dart in and you stab him, and then he dies and everything around him will also die. I tested that out, it works exactly like you think it would, it just melts everything, right? So far so good. So, when when people uh, talk about this sort of nerf, they're like, oh come on, DE, finally we got to play Ash again, finally we had something that made Ash relevant, and now you're taking that away. Boo, Ash, back to the garbage bin you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. I guess so. But the thing is, though, is that it wasn't just Ash. Like, I do my research when I do my Helminth build videos, and I want to sort of check what everyone else is doing as well. To make sure I'm not too derivative and not doing the same thing everyone else is doing. So, uh, if I'm going to do, like, a video about Banshee, I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to type in, like, Banshee Helminth. And I'm going to see what other videos there are. If I'm going to do one about Equinox, I'm going to type in Banshee, I mean, Equinox Helminth. Ash Helminth. Hildren Helminth, whatever. I want to see what other videos are out there. And here's the thing, okay? And this was popping up in the, in the last couple of days. It really didn't matter which Warframe you were searching for. You type in... Uh, Equinox Helminth, what's the top result? Equinox Marked for Death Helminth build. Banshee Marked for Death Helminth build. F fuck it. Um, who knows? Limbo Marked for Death Helminth build. It, it was... People were discovering that you could do ludicrous things with Marked for Death no matter which Warframe you were using. It was like melting things left and right. And, like, there are a couple of reasons for this. There are uh, quite a few Warframes out there that can abuse the uh, finishers, for example. Hell, Equinox can do it. You can sleep enemies with Equinox, and then you can just do finishers on them. So, a build that I saw someone doing, which seemed interesting, was... Um, here, I'll show you. Uh, 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 here, here, here. Excellent armaments. With the... Um, Please return. Covered ah, I don't have it. There's an augment uh, for Equinox, which makes it so that when you switch between day form and night form, whatever sort of stored maim damage you have uh, is gonna stay. It won't. Uh, it won't be depleted just because you switched forms. So the idea was, you switch. You, you turn on your maim, then you switch to your uh, night form, 
and then you sleep enemies, and then you mark them for death, and then you hit them with the marked for death finisher, and you kill them, and you kill everything around, around them with like m millions of damage, and and that builds up your maim counter, and then you switch back to your day form, and then you detonate your maim. It's an interesting build. Not sure how viable it was, but it's interesting. But the point is, you could do that, but and, and and it doesn't even really matter what Warframe you're using, and the reason for that is because of the uh, the focus schools, right? Um, you can do uh, anyone can just put on Naramon and get uh, executing dash, so you can void dash through enemies, and that will uh, open them up to finishers. And then you can just stab them with a finisher. So you mark for death someone, and then you void dash through them. And then you finish them, and then you kill everything around them. And and the damage numbers were so crazy. Like, I saw someone do a build about Ash using this. And he just said, like, oh, you don't have to put any any power strength in the build. You don't have to increase your, your ability strength at all. Everything will just die anyway. So you can just keep your, your ability strength at 100%. And when you say things like that, that's when you sort of have to take pause and, and be like, wait... Is that really how the ability is supposed to function? Because that doesn't sound that doesn't sound right. That sounds off. And that's exactly the thing. Because like when they nerfed it, if we're gonna use that word, uh, they did say that this isn't really a nerf so much as it is a bug fix. In that like this ability was not behaving the way it's supposed to. It's 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 not working as intended. Um, for example, it saw that like it was double dipping on damage, so it first counted damage and then it counted like elemental damage again, and it got like these stupid multipliers that it was not supposed to have. And they were like, "This, this is not, um, this is not a nerf. This is us fixing something that is, that is busted. Or, like it's, it's not supposed to behave that way." And they even said that like if you look at the wording of the skill, it says that when you stun an enemy. Uh, a portion of the damage you deal to it will be dealt to all enemies around it. But that's not what happened. It wasn't a portion. Instead, it was multiples. So if you if you do a finisher to an enemy, like, all enemies around it takes, take, like, five times the amount of damage that you do to it. And they're like, that's not, that's not how this skill is supposed to work. It's just wrong. It's coded wrong, whatever. Um, it's not supposed to behave like this. Now, that being said, that being said, they also nerfed it. They didn't just bug fix it, they also nerfed it. So it has been sort of relegated to not really working uh, very well at all right now. But the reason for that is, like, what people have to understand about these nerfs, because I think people are, are coming at this from a bit of a... Um, I don't think they really understand why things are being nerfed. People are saying that, like, oh, it's anti-fun police. As soon as someone figures out something that's fun, they're gonna nerf it. And it's that's not the case. That's not why they're doing it. It's the same reason why uh, they nerfed the uh, original sort of stuff that, that got nerfed, which is Roar and Eclipse and Warcry and Defy and stuff like that. Uh, the argument was not that they're nerfed because they're too strong. That's not what they said, and it's not true either, they aren't. If, like, Defy is not as universally good as people think it is. Hell, Eclipse is probably the most overrated ability out there. But they said, we're nerfing them because they have the possibility of being the, the overwhelming popular choices. And, and that's a bit different. Uh, a bit different, that's not... It's not because they're too strong, it's because people would just use them and nothing else. And that sort of takes away the idea of what the helmet system is supposed to be about. The helmet system is supposed to be about uh, theory crafting and experimentation and like doing wacky things left and right. And the last thing they want to see is just the community deciding that this one ability is best in slot for everyone. Ignore the rest of the helmet system. You don't need to bother with any of it. Just put take this ability, put it in everything, and call it a day. That's that's the last thing they want. Um, so if if that happens, if you find some sort of ability that's like universally, um, I'm not even gonna say the best, but just because like the roar is not the best for damage, but it's mindless. It's so easy to use. You just slot it in. 
and just call it a day. You don't have to adapt your playstyle at all. If you want to deal damage, like, hell, hell, use Equinox's Rage, right? You'll do more damage than you will with Roar. But it requires a much more active playstyle. Um, so, they, I, I guess they saw the same thing here with March for Death. Uh, with, uh, with all of the videos coming out, with the build guides left and right. Build guide number one, put March for Death on Mag. Build guide number two, put Marked for Death on Mesa, put Marked for Death on Hildren, put Marked for Death on Harrow. And, and, and that's, like, really, really not what they want to see. They don't think that's healthy for the helmet system. And it probably isn't. It probably isn't. So I guess that's the case why they did that. And I'm kind of fine with that, honestly. Honestly, I, like, I don't, I don't feel the need to be upset about it. And people, like, are saying that, like, why would you nerf something like this? That's just basically only good in the simulacrum. It's not that efficient out in, in the field because it's so wonky to use and whatever. It's it's literally just a goofy thing. But like, first of all, I don't think that's true. First of all, I think it's it was actually more viable than people give it credit for being. Um, but secondly, and here I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say the thing that nobody wants to hear. I'm gonna say the thing that's probably gonna make people a bit pissed at me, but, like... Eh, this one is kind of on us. as con And I'm talking about content creators, I'm not talking about players of the game. Um, no one ever wants to hear that, like... That we are to blame for, for nerfs happening, right? Uh, because that, that feels like shit, and, and it's... It's upsetting to even think about it in those terms. But, like... And we know that the devs are watching these videos. We know that they're not oblivious to, to what content creators are doing. And, and people are going to be like, Oh, but that's just passing the blame. That's just passing the blame for their bad game design onto the content creators. And it's like, no. No. Th that's, a, that's very easy to say. But, but hell... What if there's some truth to it, okay? Because let's face it, we have influence, right? If we, if like a huge channel with like 200, 300, 400,000 subscribers puts out a video saying like, number one broken build in the game, 5 million damage per second will nuke everything and whatnot. Extreme hyperbole like that. Um... You, you know what's gonna happen when that video comes out and, and goes viral? What's gonna happen is, whether or not that's true or not, it's gonna influence people. It's gonna influence their decision-making. decision, decision making. They're gonna follow the advice in that video because you assume that like, oh, someone who's got like 400,000 subscribers, they m pr must know what they're talking about. So, so if they say it's good, then it's probably good. Well, most people don't do the theory crafting by themselves. And, like, <laughs> I saw, for example, like, just one video saying that, like, oh, yeah, a lot of these, like, YouTuber suggestions for builds aren't actually as good as they think they are. In some cases, they even function, like, you have... You have videos where someone is like, this is the best possible ability that you can put on this Warframe because it leads to this broken interaction of, like, infinite damage. And, and like, if you're going to infuse anything on this Warframe, it needs to be this ability because it like, outclasses everything else. And then someone else just uh, made their own opinion piece saying that, like, no, this actually makes the Warframe function worse than it does in its base form. The function is worse than if you hadn't infused any ability at all. So, it's actually sort of like the worst ability that you can put in it. And and shit like that. But but it doesn't matter because, it's so to speak, the damage has already been done. This is going to influence people's decision making. They're going to follow that advice. They're going to take that Warframe. They're going to, uh, they're going to extract the ability. They're going to infuse it in that or other Warframe. And they're going to run with this build. Because someone has told them that it's good. Shit. Shit. We actually have some sort of responsibility here, right? Because I don't think... Like, I think it goes both ways. You're right. 
you can't just pass the blame to content creators for for game design issues that they exploit or whatever. But likewise, honestly, you can't just pass the blame on to the developers either for for us sort of, you know, being kind of irresponsible and just honestly, honestly in some cases, just for the sake of clickbait and for the sake of getting views, kind of kind of leading people astray and, and kind of forcing the developers' hands in, in, in stemming what would otherwise sort of break the system. They don't want to see videos that will lead to the end result of the helmet system just not being used because everyone is following the advice of YouTuber A, B, and C who are just saying, hey, put March for Death on everything. Just put March for Death on everything and call it a day. Don't bother with the helmet system otherwise. So shit. Anyway, that's my rant. Let's let's get on to the good f stuff. Let's get on to the, the cool part of the dev stream. And the cool part of the dev stream, uh, I actually think it's super cool, is the graphs they were showing with the date that they have already. Because I think people are sort of like not really reading enough into this. Um, th these graphs are way more <laughs> interesting than, than people think they are. Because they show things... If you read between the lines, uh, that are that are quite telling. Uh, so let's take a look at them. I'm I'm gonna pull them up on the screen, and we can we can sort of go through these graphs together and see what what they sort of mean and, and what you can glean from them. Right. So first up, we have um, three graphs that they showed. The the first graph is. Uh, the most subsumed Warframes. Like, these are the, the Warframes that people have and that they have chucked into the system so far and fed to the Helminth. The second graph is the most infused abilities. So that is um, what, you know, what you take and put into other Warframes. And the third one is uh, the most replaced abilities. And all of these are interesting for, like, different reasons. First up, and... This is this is um, my big takeaway from this, especially combined with the fact that Steve said on the stream that um, currently this is the Wild West. That's an interesting uh, turn of phrase. It's an interesting choice of words, because what that sort of means is, I think, is the data is all over the place. There's not enough data yet to where you can really learn anything. And I'm gonna go into that, because, like, if you look at the most subsumed Warframes, number one, Rhino. And you you could say that, like, oh, that's because of Roar, even in its nerfed form, uh, Roar is the most popular. To an extent, that's true, but also to an extent, and uh, Reb brought this up on stream, everyone has a Rhino. Everyone has a Rhino. It's super easy to farm for a Rhino. You just fight the Jackal on Venus. It's a super low-level boss. You can farm for him in a couple of seconds. It's one of the first Warframes that you can reasonably craft. They recently did the whole Deadlock Protocol thing and the revamped Jackal boss fight. So people were just running that over and over again while they were farming for all the Protea stuff. It's like everyone has a Rhino. And that sort of plays into, like, why the second most subsumed Warframe is Oberon. Oberon. And that's not because Smite is considered, like, one of the top-tier helmet abilities, but it's the same thing. Everyone has an Oberon, because you can just passively farm for it. You just kill Eximus enemies, and eventually you'll have all the Oberon parts. And if you look at, like, uh, further down the list, it's like Valkyr, Mag, Ember. Uh, these are all sort of, like... Early game Warframes that have decently useful abilities and are also very easy to farm for. Uh, Ash is an outlier and people don't really understand why. Maybe, but that's because recently they had uh, a dev stream thing leading up to the release of Heart of Dimos, where they uh, had as a Twitch drop, as a reward for watching the stream. You got parts for certain Warframes um, that would otherwise be kind of hard to farm for. Um... Those being Ash and Harrow. And I think the third one was... God, I don't even remember what the third one was. It wasn't Nidus. I remember I wished it would have been Nidus, but it wasn't. 
Uh, Korra. Korra. There's a Korra, Harrow, and Ash. So I guess a lot of people just watched those dev streams and, and got Ash that way. Uh, which sort of bumps him up in, uh, in popularity. Why I don't think uh, it had such an, a big effect on Korra and Harrow is because I think most people don't have a Korra or Harrow. And now they have one, and they don't want to take the only one they have and, and chuck it into the helmet because they're so hard to farm for. But most people probably already had an Ash, and now they just got a second, like, spare Ash that they could chuck into the helmet. That's why I think Ash is so high up. Um, other than that, it's like Volt, Banshee, Neja. Those are the uh, the Warframes that you get from your dojo. So they're very easy to... You can just go, go into your dojo and collect the pieces and build them. So it's it's... When you look at the most subsumed Warframes, it's not really based on... The, the most popular abilities. It's based on which Warframes are the hardest or easiest to farm for. Straight up. Uh, look at like the least subsumed Warframes. It's like Zaku, most people don't have him yet. Grendel, very very hard to farm for. Harrow, very hard to farm for. Octavia, not that hard to farm for, but it's I, I guess it's a bit obtuse to, to, to go through it. And Gal's hard to farm for. Gara, not hard to farm for. I have made a very fantastic, a very good. You should watch it. I made a great video on how to farm for Gara. But in Gara's case, it's also the fact that like most people don't think her ability is uh, very useful for the helmet system. But the fact that it looks like this, where it's like, oh, it's, subsuming is not sort of based on best abilities. It's just based on what, what do you have. What you have to spare. And I think most players don't have like a, a ton of Warframes just lying around. Most players probably didn't do what I did. Which is just um, spend the, the month leading up to the release of Heart of Daimos. Just farming for every single Warframe in the game again. I think most people just don't do that. And this is very telling when you come to the second graph. The second graph being the most infused abilities. Because the most infused abilities are at the top with like a, a, a ridiculous, a ridiculous overwhelming margin. The actual sort of innate helminth abilities. Not abilities that you get for subsuming, but just the actual helminth abilities themselves. Uh, the empower, the companion, the marked for death, the, the hacking, stuff like that. Now... This is also maybe a bit misleading because currently a lot of people are leveling up the Helminth and infusing these abilities on Warframes is a way of getting EXP and just leveling up uh, your Helminth so you get more subsume slots and, and whatever. So it kind of makes sense that those would be the most used. But it's also back to my first point, which is most people don't have a bunch of spare Warframes lying around. So this is what they've got. They they haven't they haven't subsumed the other warframes, so they can't put those abilities in. And but when you come to like the actual sort of uh, abilities that are being infused, there are some interesting things here. Um, as you like, the names are weird. You'll notice that. That's probably because these are the internal names. What they're what they're called like in the code of the game. Uh, but we can we can sort of figure out which which they are. Rhino Roar. Roar is the only Warframe ability that beats out some of the innate helmet abilities. So yeah, Roar is popular. But that's also because, you know, Rhino is the most subsumed Warframe. So that makes sense. It's a universal ability. You can put it on anything. It works on anything. It's no surprise that Roar, even in its nerfed form, is popular. Then you get to... Uh, Berserker's Scream, which I'm gonna say is Warcry, which also makes sense because Valkyrie is up there with the being the third most subsumed Warframe. Um, and I guess that's why Smite is so high as well, because Oberon is just uh, very popular as a subsume candidate. Otherwise, I, w I would expect Smite to be lower on the list, but I think that's the reason why. Infested Tendrils is Larva, and that one's actually kind of interesting like that that one's so high and I, I like you sort of wonder why nidus is so high because nidus is hard to farm for maybe 
maybe it has something to do with the fact that they have uh, uh, introduced a uh, 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 uh. here the the initiate pack uh, that the that you can buy in the market. It is it's like fifteen dollars. And it gives you like you know it's it's like a starter kit, where it gives you some some weapon mods, uh, a bolt or some endo, uh, and the nidus, and the nidus. So it might be that instead of farming for it because it's kind of a, a hassle to farm for, many people just sort of like put in fifteen bucks to just <laughs> to just buy a nidus that way. You also get like four hundred platinum and, and some mods and some endo. So I. That might be it. That might be the reason why um, uh, why Larva is so high on the list, even though it's from a, a fairly hard fought or hard grinded uh, Warframe. Also, probably because of a lot of the videos out there talking about um, putting Larva on Protea, for example, uh, as a very popular build. After that, you get down to like just you know. Uh, light, which is uh, that's Eclipse, yeah, yeah, that one's popular to put in, even though it's not very good. Um, okay, because everyone just uh, overhyped it again. To uh, again, I don't know, content creators, the community, everyone got their uh, got their trousers in a bunch about Eclipse, talking about how good it is, and like, wow, look at these 500% damage numbers, and it's like, that's not how the skill works. <sighs> oh well. Odalisk Dispensary, that is Protea's Dispensary. Wisp Harness, that's Breach Surge. I'm interested in why Breach Surge is so high. I don't think it's because of my Saren video. <laughs> no, I think it might be because of the talk about, like, Breach Surge and Garuda. Whatevs. Dragon Luck, that's Elemental Ward. Fire Blast is Fire Blast. Iron Frame Strip is Pillage. Interesting that Pillage is so high, but that's a very good skill. But if you look at, like, further down in the list, at the bottom, right? All the way, all the way down in the bottom, you got Priest Condemned. And that's, you know, that's Condemned. That's Harrow's Condemned. And that's a really good ability. It's a really good ability... But no one is infusing it because no one is feeding a harrow into the helmet system because no one has a harrow to spare. And, and this is kind of, again, why we're talking about, like, the Wild West in terms of these numbers and the data's all over the place. Because I don't think they have all that much data yet. When I look at this, what this tells me is that most people aren't really experimenting all that much with the helmet system. Um... Which is kind of understandable because, as they said, this was supposed to be sort of like for endgame players. And with the resource costs, only sort of endgame players can sort of have access to it. But that does mean that, like, it, collecting data would take longer. Collecting data takes longer than if they make the system accessible for everyone. Now it's only got, like, going to be a very small percentage of all Warframe players who are going to be playing around with this. Very small. And... As such, we don't know all that much yet. So when you you can't really be like taking the stance of, oh, you gotta look at the the bottom here, the most infused abilities, and you gotta bump them up because they're not infused because they're shit. Ah, I'm not sure. Like for some of them, yeah, but like condemn, it's in the bottom. It's in the bottom ten, but but it's not. The reason why it's not being infused is not because it's a bad ability. It's because no one, no one has it. No one has it to spare. If everyone had a harrow, that would not be in the bottom. So, so I think they have to wait a bit with doing buffs and stuff because I don't think they have enough data yet to to sort of make any judgment calls on what needs to be buffed or not. We're gonna have to wait quite a lot longer for people to collect all the warframes and really start theory crafting and experimenting. And figuring this stuff out. And I guess, again, that's where we content creators come in. And we can do good. We can do good stuff by doing this theory crafting for people. And giving people inspiration on like what to do. And sort of fiddling around with it. And that means we have to be open to experimentation. That means we have to like sort of set our goal toward sort of exploring the more 
obscure things, the more niche things, and like take the take the warframes that that are a bit more off kilter. Like hell, experiment with Zaku, experiment with I don't know <laughs> Zephyr. We're gonna Z- Zephyr Deluxe is coming, um, and sort of figuring out what you can do with them instead of just going toward like uh, I don't know Mesa or. Hey, Saren. Hey, hey, I made videos with Saren. <laughs> no. But for real, though. Um, and not just being like, Hey, put Marked for Death on everything. Most broken. One million billion gorillion damage. This is the only video you'll need. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. It's not It's not good for the game if, <laughs> if we do that. It really isn't. And I'm not passing the blame, but it really isn't good for the game. Anyway. Third graph, and this one is also interesting, and this is probably more interesting for the developers to look at, and that is what the most replaced abilities are. Um, What abilities are people like, oh yeah, I don't need this. Chuck it to make room for something else. And, like, this is also indicative of what the most popular Warframes are. That Mesa's number one is the most replaced ability, it does not just tell us that Mesa's number one is kind of useless as part of her kit. It also tells us that Mesa is a very popular Warframe. Um, for the fact that that, that ability is replaced. Um, it's interesting to note absences. It's interesting to note if there are popular Warframes that are not on this list of the most replaced abilities. Because that probably tells us that they have a very good kit. As it is. And like there is nothing that you really sort of can replace in that kit. Which is probably good. If you have a really popular Warframe and it's not in this list, that means it's it's a well-designed Warframe. Uh, Necros number one. Yeah, Soul Punch is a garbage ability. It just, it does nothing. And a lot of people like running Necros because they like farming for materials. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's a popular Warframe. Inaros, very popular Warframe. Inaros, number three, also a garbage ability. No surprises there. And the fact that Chroma is as high on this list as it is, it sort of tells me, again, that it's endgame players who are, who are using this system. Because, you know, I think most new players or even intermediate players, they aren't probably playing around with Chroma. The reason why you play around with Chroma is because you do profit taker runs. And that's what Chroma is the best for. So endgame players, oh yeah, for like Eidolons as well. He has uses for Eidolons as well. So endgame players, they use Chroma. That's why he's high on the list. New players don't really use Chroma. Um, and Chroma's number one is a garbage ability. It really is. So replacing that, no big surprise. Volt replacing his number one, no big surprise. Rhino number one, I understand why. And that is because Rhino's number one is very important for uh, certain builds that try to sort of use the armor mechanics. But for intermediate players or new players or whatever, it's the the least relevant part of the kit. Um, because you're not going to take advantage of those um, stuff like Arcane Tanker or, or the Augments or whatever. So for them... Uh, the, the number two, three, and four are much more important. And Rhino is the outlier here because Rhino is, again, the most subsumed Warframe and the most, like, just... Everyone has a Rhino. Everyone has a Rhino. A lot of people are playing Rhino. Uh, which is why we then come down to, like, Excalibur being also in the top list. Because so many, so many new players. It's like, maybe you only have an Excalibur, nothing else. Uh, Excalibur actually is like two times on the list, uh, very high up. Excalibur's number three and Excalibur's number one are very commonly replaced. Probably replaced with Warcry, I'm gonna say, or War, who knows. Um, other than that, I don't think there's all that much we can learn from this yet. Um... Replacing Ash, number one and four, like... These numbers are all over the place. It's it's very hard to sort of learn 
anything from this yet. Other than that, if if an if a Warframe shows up like several times in this list and has like several abilities that people gladly sort of replace with something else that might be indicative of the fact that the Warframe is currently not that well designed and doesn't have like a kit with abilities that synergize with each other and they might um, want to take a look at that in that case to, to see if, if like maybe maybe the ability or maybe that Warframe needs to be reworked. So I don't think you should look at like Mesa's number one and being like um, drawing too many conclusions from that. I think you should look at stuff like, if a Warframe shows up, like, two or three times on this list with the most appraised abilities, that might be a reason to to take a closer look at that Warframe. It's like, Rhino, people are placed at number one or the number four. Ash, people are placed at number one or the number four. It's a bit sad that everyone is just replacing Protea as number four because it just doesn't work with the rest of her kit. Oh well. Oh well. So, all in all, when I look at these uh, these graphs, um, what what it tells me, what it tells me is that currently the numbers are very low for all of this. Currently, they do not have a whole lot of data, which is unfortunate. Which means it's up to us to sort of like. Uh, keep doing theory crafting right and keep doing these build guides and figuring out uh new warframes new ability combinations give people an incentive to play around with the system more now to that extent um it's a double-edged sword because the resource costs are so high the resource costs are super high which means that only sort of end game players have access to it uh which means they won't get a whole lot of data they can fix that problem by lowering the resource costs but if they do then it's no longer going to be just for end game players it's going to be for everyone right and the end game players they really wanted to have something that was sort of like just for them so i don't know what what takes president right um presidents president presidents um what's most important i lean toward hey I think the whole thing about like just making a divide between endgame players and new players is kind of pointless. Yes, I know, it, the game is overwhelming to new players, it throws too much stuff at you, and this is another thing that the game could like sort of throw at you before you're ready for it. Sure, there is that argument. On the other hand, I don't know, by the time you reach Deimos, you've already cleared Earth and Venus and Mercury and Mars, Hell, probably, like, Phobos as well. I don't know. You, you've been playing the game for quite some time. I don't think it's that big of a deal to throw this at you at w as well. But, um... Um... I kind of like the idea of lowering the resource costs to let more people theorycraft with this and to let more people have access to it and experiment with it. Um... Because I think... Uh, I think we'll see a lot of more fun stuff. I'll, I think we'll see a lot more experimentation if more people have access to it, because hey, hey, two brains are better than one, okay? More people means more ideas than if just there are a very, like, small subset of people, like, toying around with this. And I'm fine with new players having stuff as well. I think it's a bit lame, the, the idea that, like, oh, no, this should only be for us as veterans. Nah, man, let, let everyone have fun. Let everyone have fun. I'm, I'm all for letting everyone have fun. And they did say in the dev stream that they are going to take a look at the, the resource costs. And they are going to take a look specifically at, like, bile costs and whatnot. So we'll see. We'll see what they do. Um, we'll figure that one out uh, in due time. Maybe, like, next week or so. Anywho. Anywho. That's, that's my rant. That's my rant. That's, that's what I wanted to say about all of this. I'm going to continue doing Helminth build guides. I'm going to try to focus on more niche things. Um, it just takes some time, right? Because to make a build, you usually have to sort of 
take a Warframe, you have to level it up a couple of times and slot in the amount of Forma you need. You probably need to collect one or two Augments. You need to test stuff out in different sort of like labs and whatnot until you sort of figure out what works and what doesn't. So it's actually like quite a lot of work that goes into making these, these uh, Helminth build guides. But I'm going to keep on doing them because they're fun. And apparently... Apparently not a lot of people are doing it yet, and apparently it is still the Wild West, where, you know, all bets are off. So, that's gonna be fun. You're gonna, you're gonna get to experience that with me. And you can you can give me some ideas. You can give me some ideas if you want to. You can uh, use this comment section to tell me about your crazy build idea that you uh, have imagined in your head that you haven't been able to sort of try out yet, maybe you don't have the resource costs for it. Maybe you'd like to see some content creator go check that out and see if it works and make a video about it. Hey, I could be that guy. I could be that guy for you. Would you like me to be that guy for you? Because I can be that guy for you. If you would like to uh, have me be that guy for you, please let me know in the comment section. Yeah, put put that comment in there. Do it. Do it right now. Come on, type. <laughs> All right. That's it for me. That's it for me. Uh, I will see you again tomorrow for more of our regular scheduled programming.